And of course, uh, Putin has spoken this morning, uh, many people suggesting that he looks worried, that this is the most precarious position that he's been in in, in decades um, as, as the president of, uh, of Russia. He referred, he didn't name uh, Prigozhin uh, personally, but he talked about them being traitors, which, which again seems to be ill judged because what you're doing then is 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 baiting the bear so you know prigozhin now is saying my men are not traitors right they are they are patriots they are they are russian we are fed up with the corruption and all of that in moscow and we are to, we are to end it so the closer he gets to moscow he's gone from saying this is not a coup uh, this is just a march of defiance to saying we want to end corruption and and my men are patriots. The, the language is even changing so quickly. We can't keep up. Well, that's exactly right. And so it's just, it's it's hard to know what happens. But the thing we have to think about with respect to Vladimir Putin is, right, How what does he do in response? Does this cause him to lash out, right? Um, does this cause him to, uh, to try and assert even more aggressive control, right? Even if he's successful against Prigozhin and puts this down, does this mortally wound him? And if it does, do we get somebody worse? It's not clear that the next leader, I mean, as bad as Putin is, it's not clear the next leader of Russia is going to be, you know, some, some you know, democracy-loving, you know, yeah. uh, a hero for the West. And so, um, you know, in fact, the, the odds are that's not the outcome. Um, and so, and Prigozhin certainly is not that. Um, no. And so, you know, one of the things to figure out is, you know, as this thing plays out, and you're right to say, how's Prigozhin likely to react, right? But the question also is, how is Putin likely to react to these provocations? Does it cause him to use this as an opportunity to say, look, this is a, which it is not to be clear, but this is a British, Russia, you know, uh, yeah. Ukrainian, American plot, and then cause him to get more aggressive in his campaign in an effort to bring the Russian people back his way. You know, that's, this, in a lot of ways, this is a fight for the hearts and minds in the first instance of the Russian military. And then second, a fight for the hearts and minds of the Russian people it's not clear who has the upper hand right now. The fact that we're even saying that in a Vladimir Putin controlled Russia, I think it's something nobody would have necessarily expected six months ago, three months ago, a year ago. And it's precisely because of his failed campaign in Ukraine that we're here. And and I was talking to another guest a little bit earlier. This, of course, we we're all thinking, a lot of people are thinking, good, this could be the end of the conflict. But it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, right? Because if you do get a general, um, you know, a military person who actually knows what they're doing taking over Russia, if that were to happen, that could be significantly worse for Ukraine. No, that's exactly right. And let's be clear, right? Prigozhin's beef is not necessarily with the war itself. It might be with the war itself, but a lot of it is about the way the war is being fought. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, and whether the war is successful. And so it's not clear that Prigozhin is like, let's just all go home and, and end this thing, right? Or that that's where he would end up if he were in power or his allies were in power. So I think that people reading this as, oh, anything that undermines Putin is positive for the war in Ukraine. That may be true in the short run. And there's certainly an opportunity here as Russian forces are in disarray, as the Wagner group is leaving the, leaving the battlefield and heading towards Moscow for the Ukrainians to take advantage. That doesn't mean necessarily, though, that in the long run, this is net net good for Ukraine or net net good for the West, because even if Putin is weakened, a weakened Putin can cause him to lash out or it could cause it to be replaced by somebody worse. It's hard to imagine somebody worse than Vladimir Putin, but I'm sure there let are. me tell you, that exists. <laughs> yeah. That's right, that, uh, that I mean, exists. But you, you say the Zelensky taking advantage of the situation. Uh, again, he's got to be cautious at this point point too because if he can you know my enemy's enemy is my friend i mean if, if the wagner group and the russian military you know see behind their backs you know the 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 ukrainians taking advantage of this situation uh, could that join them back together again so they, they you know there is there is a, a sense here that although it would be the perfect time it feels like for zelensky to really mount that offensive that he's been wanting to do but on the other hand Oh, could it cause more trouble? You know, Petri, it's a great point. I think it's certainly possible that a, a renewed Ukrainian offensive that starts to go well could cause everyone to turn back and, and the Wagner group to rejoin. But it does appear that things are so broken at this point between uh, Moscow and Prigozhin 
Uh, it's hard to see these 25,000. I mean, it's hard to see how, how you unwind this. Again, you know, hours earlier, when, as you point out, Prigozhin was saying this is a march of defiance, right? We're not, we're not trying to replace the leadership, right? I think in, in many ways, it, it does appear that some commentators are saying that what his attempt was to do is to hope that Putin would remove the generals that were, that were in Prigozhin's view, constraining him and not running this war the right way. But that's not how it's gone. Putin has come out now directly against him. He's now come out against Putin. It's hard to see how this doesn't end with one of the two sides clearly taking control of the situation, right? Um, and there is a Russian, there's Russian history for, you know, uh, uh, people who have opposed the government end up being brought back into public life and, and ultimately being successful. Uh, but that's the rare option, right? That is the rare scenario. And so if these 25,000 troops are off the battlefield for any amount of time, even for the, the few days and weeks this thing goes on for, or are permanently taken out because the Russian military acts against them, that's a major loss for Russian capability in Ukraine now and going forward. So um, at some point, whether it's now or later, uh, Zelensky will have the opportunity to take uh, take advantage of this, um, and and that that is good for Ukraine. Yeah, and not and not least that the Russian soldiers that are inexperienced that are there could very easily. Uh, that's another concern: is throw down their weapons and just say, "Well, you know, we can't do this on our own." So. Well, that, that, that's a great point, Petri. Exactly. I mean, so look. I mean, if you're if you're a Russian soldier today sitting in Ukraine and you see the military district that controls eastern Ukraine, sort of military district under control of not not the government directing you, not the our leaders that are governing you, right? You're probably saying, why why am I going to die in yeah. this war, right? And you're thinking that to yourself. And every Russian troop in Ukraine's got to be thinking that way right now. And that's not good for Putin's fight in Ukraine either. Good for Ukraine, bad for Russia. Yeah, absolutely that. Listen, Jamil, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much uh, for being being talking to us first, just as we've woken up this morning for you. Uh, Jamil Jaffer, the founder and uh, executive director of the National Security Institute at the George Mason University in Washington, uh, D.C.